Welcome back, everybody, with your Bibles and with your beards. <laughs> That's what uh, BYOB really stands for. Bring your own beard. <laughs> Not bring your own beer. Uh, actually, I, I stole that from Scott Hahn, who said one time, uh, BYOB means bring your own Bible. It has nothing to do with beer. So welcome back to everyone with beards and Bibles in hand. And let us ask the Holy Spirit to inspire us, to understand uh, the words that he inspired the scripture writers to pen so that we might grow closer to Christ. And not only grow closer to him, but imitate him. Indeed, to become another Christ, which is really the purpose of scripture study. Not just to fill the head, but to fill the heart and ultimately to fill our lives with the grace of God. And so today, we study the one who was filled to her plenitude with grace, so that she was jam-packed with grace. She was so full of grace, you couldn't cram another iota of grace into her. Who am I talking about? The Blessed Virgin Mary. She who is referred to by the title of kekaritomene in Greek. Uh, absolutely overbrimming with grace. As we launch into this new session we ask for the intercession of our blessed mother mary she was filled with grace to open our hearts to the holy spirit he who is the, the very vehicle of grace uh, in the church and in the world let us pray in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen come holy spirit fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, did instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice, enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The Immaculate Conception, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. St. Luke, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just by uh, way of review, let us uh, look at uh, the homework uh, questions, uh, statements, the true and false statements from the last class to kind of wrap it up and to kind of give us a head of steam as we uh, keep moving forward in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Did you notice that uh, the reason we're doing these particular kinds of backgrounds is because it should correlate and correspond to what Luke is talking about in his gospel. So last week's study on the gospel of Luke chapters 1 verses 1 through 25 talked about the Old Testament priesthood embodied in Zechariah and even in the Levitical woman uh, Elizabeth. And so it seemed to be a good segue, seemed to be a good opportunity to study about the power brokers in Palestine, the priests, the Levites, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Essenes, and, and so on and so forth. So too today, as we look at Mary, who is really highlighted in that first chapter of Luke, especially in verses 26 through 56, we want to have a uh, a session just on Mary so that we can really milk or at least do our best to get all the, the riches and the wisdom that St. Luke has packed into his first chapter, just even those verses. So today, before we get to that, let's review our homework. And as I've done in the past, I've got here the answers, because sometimes I get a little carried away. Have you noticed? <laughs> How can you not get carried away studying the scriptures when you're asked for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Well, he might inspire you, and then you can't help yourself, and you just off and running. So here are the answers, in case I get off and running, uh, on giving you, uh, as we review these homework statements. Number one, Jesus and his apostles' work was not publishing but uh, a book, but establishing a church. And the answer is true. And I got that from 
Scott Hahn's book, Consuming the Word, page 49. Number two, St. Clement of Rome, I think he was the fourth pope, was, according to ancient tradition, a disciple of Peter and Paul. That also is true. I got that from Consuming the Word, page 53. Number three, in first century Israel, power was divided among an executive, legislators, and the judiciary. And the answer to number three is false. And that came from my, my notes, the study guide, which I hope by now you have. Number four, the term Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word meaning separated ones. And that's true. And that came from my study notes. But it's also uh, much more thoroughly described if you have your Ignatius Catholic Study Bibles. On page 69, you'll find occasionally these rather lengthy essays, excursus, on various topics. On page 69, you have an essay called Who Are the Pharisees? And if you'd like to know more about them, I invite you to read that. But there it describes how the word parushim means separated ones. Number four. Number five, the Sadducees rejected the Torah and accepted the bodily resurrection. And I gave you a clue in Matthew 22, verse 23, where Jesus has this encounter, this confrontation, really, uh, with the Sadducees who deny the resurrection, deny the resurrection and accept the Torah. So, number five is false. Number six, the intertestamental period refers to the 400 years between the patriarch Joseph and Moses. And even though I didn't go into great depths about the intertestamental period, if you looked at the map, uh, not the map, but the chart at the end of the last, uh, at, at, at the end of the, the study notes for the last session, you'll see the intertestamental period was not a time between the patriarch Joseph and uh, Moses, but really the time between Malachi and the coming of Christ. So, number six is false. Number seven, the scribes were highly educated copyists of sacred texts like the Torah. And number seven is true. Number eight, there is no evidence in the New Testament for the role of bishop, priest, and deacon. And number eight is false. And I pointed out to you those texts uh, from the Acts of the Apostles, the ordination of the first seven deacons, uh, from 1 Peter, that talks about the elders, the presbyteroi, the early priests. And then from 1 Timothy, where um, St. Paul tells Timothy it's an admirable thing to desire to be a bishop. So deacon, priests, and bishops are clearly mentioned, if not in great detail, but at least as a regular part of the life of the early church. Indeed, the intention of Christ. So number eight is false, because there is evidence for that. Number nine, the Herodians were a puppet government that served at the pleasure of Caesar in Rome, and that is true. And number 10, the Essenes were essentially a modern-day religious order like Jesuits or Franciscans, and that is true. Those last few just came from my study notes. So if you didn't uh, notice how I answered them, hopefully you can look at this chart and see that you got 100%. Did everybody do great on the quiz or on the, the homework? I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. Just a review of what we're going to, uh, what we said we're going to cover today. So, session four, Mirroring Mary. I asked you to read chapter one, verses 26 through 56 in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, along with the footnotes on pages 105 to 106, weren't those footnotes awe-inspiring? I don't know about you, but I love them. I reviewed them immediately before uh, videotaping this class. 
was just so moved by them. One of the reasons I highly recommend the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible is because uh, Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch draw not only upon scripture scholarship, but on the saints and the popes and the councils and the catechism of the Catholic Church to, to shed light on the pages of sacred scripture. Because it is, a, it is the same Holy Spirit that is inspiring St. Luke, that is also inspiring the Pope at the time. So there was mention of ineffabilis Deus, Pius IX declaring that Mary was immaculately conceived. And the uh, references to St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. Augustine, my personal hero, uh, and how they saw uh, those first few verses of Luke uh, and, and so on and so forth. The council of Ephesus, where Mary, as the Theotokos, the mother of God, was defined. It is the same Holy Spirit <laughs> at work in the church through the, the authority figures that he has established that is also at work in the scriptures. And so we should not be surprised that there is this overlap and this beautiful mutual interpenetration, you could say, between the scriptures and the tradition and the magisterium of the church. And that's why I love the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. It brings all of that together uh, in one book, and it should. I think that was God's plan. And then, if you had a chance to read the essay, Mary, Ark of the Covenant, on page 107, again, very illuminating, uh, very illuminating and insightful. And then I'll be using today Scott Hahn's book, Hail Holy Queen, uh, for many of the comments that I'll make. Shall we get started? And before we do, <laughs> I just have to say, I, I, I want to invite you to approach this session, not so much in an academic mindset, or with, the, with, with your brain cells all charged up and ready to learn new things. Instead, I'd like you to kind of recalibrate your approach to this session and see it more in terms of meditation and even prayer. Because when, when you approach your mom, you, you don't approach her with all kinds of rational arguments and intellectual ideas. You approach your mom with your heart. And so that's what we want to do in this session. We want to approach our Mother Mary with hearts full of love for her, but ultimately for her son, Jesus, because that's what she always tells us. Look at him. <laughs> uh, and, and we go through Mary to Jesus only because she's the shortcut to Christ. All the, the, aberrations and the mistakes and the stumblings and the sins we commit in going to Christ, she can clarify. She can say, no, 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 don't do that. Here's how you come to my son. And that's why we study Mary. That's why we ask for her intercession. That's why we ask for her protection. That's why I pray the rosary every day. And by the way, this is a glow-in-the-dark rosary. And so if it's if you lose all the light and the electricity, I can still pray the rosary because uh, the light of Christ shines through Mary and guides us in a dark world. So try to have a prayerful approach to this session, more of a meditation than, than a study of, of scholarship, more about becoming a saint and falling in love. We want to look at Mary in four different uh, aspects or under four different categories. First of all, as the woman of Genesis. Genesis refers to a woman, and we can see that it is a prophetic reference into the future, and we will see that it's really Mary, who is the woman of Genesis. Secondly, we will see Mary as the woman of the Davidic kingdom. At the time of King David, the establishment of the monarchy, he rules over a united kingdom. He passes that on as an inheritance to his son Solomon. 
And Solomon enthrones his mother as his queen mother on his right hand. And that was Bathsheba. And she is a prefiguration of Mary, the woman of the Davidic kingdom. The queen mother is a, an echo, a, a preparation for the fulfillment of the queen mother in Mary. In the third uh, light in which we will try to see our mother Mary is from the book of Revelation as the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, at the end of chapter 11, the beginning of chapter 12, John is looking up into heaven and he sees the Ark of the Covenant, this ancient acacia wood box covered in gold. That was the Ark of the Covenant. But as he looks up into heaven, he sees not this box, but a bride, a beautiful woman. And, this, and the saints and the scholars down through the ages, not all of them, but the saints and the scholars down through the ages in, in, in line and in thinking with the church, thinking with the Catholic faith, have always seen that as Mary. And then finally, the fourth light or fourth aspect under which we'll try to uh, approach our Blessed Mother Mary is as an icon of the church. She is today, and she was from the very first moment of her conception, what we are all supposed to be. Namely, full of grace. Kekaritomene in Greek. We will never be as full of grace as she is, but that's what we're aiming for, because that's what Christ came to do. He has achieved in her, as in a masterpiece, what he's trying to achieve in this slug named Father John, in this sinner, trying to be a saint. I look to Mary because there Jesus unveils his masterpiece and what he calls me and you and the whole church to be at the end of time. So Mary is an icon, a prayerfully painted masterpiece by Christ himself of the church. And that's what we're going to try to do today prayerfully, meditatively, not so much intellectually. Going back then to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. You know, there are certain key scripture texts that all scripture scholars like you should have memorized. Uh, there's a lot of them. But one of them has to be Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. What does that read? Well, you know, the first two chapters of Genesis was the creation story and this Edenic garden, this garden of Eden, where man and woman walk in friendship, intimacy with God the Father. And then there's the fall in chapter 3. But immediately after the fall, because God the Father loves us so much, he doesn't leave us to our uh, our own devices. He comes to our defense and he promises a future uh, restoration, not just of the Garden of Eden, but ultimately to be able to go into the Garden of Paradise. And who is a pivotal figure in that? Obviously, Jesus Christ. But who is also right next to him? It's our Mother Mary. And so we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God says, and God has before him now the ancient serpent, Adam, and Eve. And he says to them, I will put enmity, warfare, between you and the woman, now speaking to the serpent and speaking to Eve, and between your offspring and hers. And they will strike at your head, meaning the offspring of Eve will strike at your head, while you will strike at their heel. This is often called the Proto-Evangelium. Proto-Evangelium. comes from two words, euangelion, the Greek for angel or messenger or good news, and proto, meaning the first kind or a prototype, 
the first announcement of the good news. The good news that God would save us from Satan. And how would he do it? Through a woman and her seed. You've seen, I'm sure, many statues of Mary. We have a very beautiful one in St. Anne's Chapel. Just as you walk in, you see a statue of Mary. And she's standing on what looks like the earth, a kind of sphere. And under her feet is a very startling image, a snake. And what is happening between the woman and the snake? The woman takes her foot and stomps on his head. You know what's happening in that statue? Genesis 3.15. Every time you see that statue, every time you see a, a holy card, and it has Mary with her foot on the head of a snake, you should remember Genesis 3.15. The proto euangelion the, the first announcement of the good news. In this book by Scott Hahn, Hail Holy Queen, uh, he says something very beautiful that I'd like to like to share with you on page 45 it's in your notes if you have the study guide all those teachers he's talking about the saints throughout the ages clearly discerned the message of the new eve what i was just saying that genesis 3 15 is referring not just to eve back in the time of the garden of eden and they're about to be expelled but to the the final eve the new eve mary all those teachers clearly discern the message of the new Eve. It is this, obey God, who is her son, her spouse, the Holy Spirit, who overshadowed her so that she would conceive Christ, and her father, God the Father. Do whatever he tells you. You know where that's from. John chapter 2, where Mary tells the servants, do whatever my son tells you. The medieval poets summed it up neatly by pointing out that the angel Gabriel's Ave, A-V-E, the Latin greeting, Hail, reversed the name of Ava in Latin, which is Eve, E-V-A. So also did it reverse the rebellious inclination of Eve left to her children, the rebellious inclination Eve left to her children, to you and me, and replace it with the readiness to obey which Mary wants to teach us. Why do we look to Mary? Because she teaches us how to resist the, the satanic temptations that the first Eve fell to, but Mary is victorious over, thanks to the grace of Christ. And she teaches us to obey our Lord and Savior. So that's a, a snapshot of the new Eve. Mary, the fulfillment, uh, or at least the first installment of the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Incidentally, can I just uh, make a reference at this point to Elaine Pagels, our favorite little Princeton uh, professor of religion and her Gnostic Gospels? You can, you can tell I kind of like this Gnostic Gospel business. I've been mentioning how the Gnostic Gospels uh, teach heresy. <laughs> a, a, a version of Christianity that's not at all Christian. Last time I talked about how one of the things that uh, Gnosticism believes is that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, that his body is still decomposing uh, you know, outside of Jerusalem, where Joseph of Arimathea buried it. It hasn't risen gloriously from the dead. Well, now I'd like to tell you something else about the Gnostic Gospels, just so you can see how far of, off they are. And it has to do with who Eve is. Their understanding of Eve in the Old Testament is radically different than our understanding. And I'm just going to read from one of these texts. Uh, it's not a gospel per se. It's called the Hypostasis of the archons, hypostasis of the archons. And I'm reading from page 31 in the Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels. The hypostasis of the archons describes Eve as the spiritual principle in humanity who raises Adam from his merely material condition. 
In other words, instead of being a stumbling block for Adam, she's the one who actually helped him to become fully himself. And now she quotes from the hypostasis of the archons, and I'm reading. And the spirit-endowed woman, very different kind of woman than I just described, came to Adam and spoke with him, saying, Arise, Adam. And when he saw her, he said, It is you who have given me life. You shall be called mother of the living. Notice how they twist, how they twist the sacred scriptures. For it is she who is my mother. It is she who is the physician and the woman and she who has given birth. It goes on. Then the female spiritual principle came in the snake. Notice the snake is the hero, not the villain in the story, according to the Gnostics. The instructor. And it taught them, saying, You shall not die. For it was out of jealousy that he, God, said this to you. Rather, your eyes shall be open, and you shall become like gods, recognizing evil and good. Then it says, And the arrogant ruler cursed the woman, who's the arrogant ruler, quote-unquote arrogant ruler, our loving God, Father Almighty, who desires our happiness more than we do. And yet the Gnostic Gospels describe him as the arrogant ruler, cursed the woman and the snake. I just wanted to give you another sense of why the Gnostic Gospels were rejected as heresy by the early church. They had a very different vision of Eve, <laughs> and therefore the new Eve and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would certainly not fit that vision. Moving on then to the second aspect or the second light that we want to shine and try to uh, approach with great love and tenderness our mother Mary is as the queen mother, the woman of the Davidic kingdom. Notice how in each a snapshot of Mary, mirror, mirroring Mary, she arrives at the most critical moments, at the very beginning of salvation history, in the Proto-Evangelion, at the very apex of the Davidic kingdom, in its glory days, with David and Solomon reigning over a united kingdom. And then at the very end of salvation history in Revelation, just by way of understanding how Mary punctuates salvation history at the most critical times. And our scriptures, if we're humble enough, we notice how the scriptures teach us to love our mother Mary and how the scriptures mirror Mary. So the second aspect, Mary as the queen mother, the woman of the Davidic kingdom. And even though I could grab the scriptures and open it and read it, you have it right there in your notes. So let me just read what's happening in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. So Bathsheba, who is Bathsheba? King David's wife. And with Bathsheba, David has a son named Solomon, who then becomes the king. To speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. Adonijah was another one of David's sons. By the way, David had 19 sons with at least seven different wives. So, and the king, meaning Solomon, rose to meet her and bowed down to her. And then she sat on his throne. And then he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother. And she sat on his right. A couple of points to bring out in that rich, rich scripture passage, 1 Kings 2, 19. King Solomon is now reigning as the king. He has received the blessing of his father, David. He is now the rightful ruler of the Davidic kingdom. Even though he is the head of the monarchy, when his mother walks into the courtroom, what does he do? He stands. Amazing gesture. Because no one ranks higher than the king in the kingdom. And yet he shows tremendous deference uh, and, and love for his mother. And not only does he stand, but what else does he do? Did you notice? He does this. He bows to her. He bows to her. Uh, what tremendous love and affection and authority that he gives to his mother. 
the queen mother. That institution of the queen mother, who, by the way, that he seats on his right, he is still a king, but clearly, who has the ear of the king? The queen mother does. Not that he does everything that she says or suggests, but certainly takes it into great consideration. What was the institution of the queen mother in, in, the, in the ancient uh, time of the kingdom of David? We read, the institution of the Gebi Ra, the great lady, literally, great lady, meant the woman ordinarily honored as queen was not the wife of the king, but the mother of the king. Did you catch that? So sitting at the right-hand side of the king, Solomon, is not King Solomon's wife, but King Solomon's mom. <laughs> Let me uh, read why this is so critical, this seating of the queen mother to the right of the king rather than the king's wife. Now I'm going to read again from Hail Holy Queen, page 78. Uh, Scott Hahn explains, in the ancient Near East, most nations were monarchies, like the Davidic kingdom, ruled by a king. In addition, most cultures practiced polygamy, multiple wives to the same guy. Did you ever see that uh, TV show, Big Love? <laughs> it was a, a TV show about a family that had a, a husband who had three wives. Obviously, had not even sure why I mentioned that, except one of my favorite actors who recently passed away played the man, uh, Bill Paxton. Um, in any case, just a reference to a modern day polygamy. So a given king often had several wives. This posed problems, as you can imagine. First, whom should the people honor as the queen? Because you have maybe three, four, five eligible queens to be honored as the queen. In the case of King David, you had at least seven wives and multiple concubines. That's listed in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, by the way. But more important, whose son should receive the right of succession to the throne? You can see the, the challenge for monarchical succession. Who's going to take the king's place when the king passes? Scott Hahn goes on. In most Near Eastern cultures, these twin problems were resolved by a single custom. The woman ordinarily honored as queen was not the wife of the king, but the mother of the king. And so you can see what's happening in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, when Bathsheba walks in to Solomon's court. He's reigning and ruling as king. He stands, he bows, and seats her at the right-hand side, solving the problem of polygamy. Which queen is, is, is ruling the roost? Uh, which sons are going to be the heir apparent? Uh, it's the queen mother who has the ear of the king. Uh, the last point there, this institution wasn't just something that existed at the time of David and Solomon and then it disappeared. A queen mother reigned next to the Davidic king from Bathsheba, mother of King Solomon, all the way to Nehushta, the mother of King Jeconiah. Jehoiachin, sorry, not Jeconiah, Jehoiachin. Lastly, let's, and scripturally, let's look at Mary as the Ark of the Covenant, the woman of Revelation. We've looked at Mary as the woman of of Genesis in the Proto-Evangelion at Genesis 3.15. We've looked at Mary as the queen mother, the woman of the Davidic kingdom, the authority, the respect, uh, the power, really, that she has in the Davidic kingdom, ruling at the right of the king. And now the third way of looking at Mary and understanding Mary is as uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And just in case... Uh, uh, I didn't make it clear enough um, how Mary is a fulfillment of the Queen Mother. We only have to look at John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. You know what's happening in John chapter 2, the wedding feast at Cana in Galilee. And we see Mary functioning almost in that role 
of the Queen Mother. Who is the king in the kingdom of God? Jesus is. And who does he seat next to him? Who has his ear? Who can whisper requests into his ear? And he listens. And if it is according to the will of God, his father, he does it. It's Mary. And we see that modeled in this marriage at Cana in Galilee. We read in chapter 2, I'm just going to back up to the very beginning, verse 1. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And here comes the money verse, if you ask me, verse 4. And Jesus said to her, O woman, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Why is that the money verse? Because there Mary is referred to as the woman. She is the woman of Genesis. She is the woman of the Davidic kingdom. And now she is the woman in the kingdom of God where Jesus is the king. And the woman who is his queen mother is seated at his right. And she makes a request. What request? They have no wine. And Jesus, we, 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 could, we could get into the, uh, the scriptural nuances of that exchange, uh, whether he wants to do it or doesn't want to do it, if he's rejecting her request, he's accept, honoring her request. But ultimately, he does it. Because she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And then Jesus uh, immediately performs his first great miracle, changing of water into wine at the wedding at Cana in Galilee. You have the queen mother seated next to the king, making a request, and the king honors the request. Mary is the Gebira in the kingdom of God, the woman. And now we can see Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. Fast forward again to the, the third aspect of Mary in the book of Revelation, the woman of Revelation. We read in Revelation at the end of chapter 11, the beginning of chapter 12, we mentioned before how there were no chapters when John wrote the book of Revelation. Those were added later by Cardinal Stephen Langton in the 12th century. But what did, we, what did John write? He wrote continuously without chapter pause. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of the covenant was seen. A great portent appeared in heaven. A, say it with me everybody, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. There she is. If you've ever seen an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I have a very small one here, you might not be able to see it well, but maybe that'll focus in on that. Uh, you have exactly the woman of Revelation 12, chapter uh, 12, verse 1. Clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. The 12 stars symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel, of the Old Testament, the, the 12 apostles of the Lamb of the New Testament. She is the queen. The ancient ark, let's get back to the Ark of the Covenant. The ancient ark contained three items. Symbolic manna, bread, the tablets of stone, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and thirdly, Aaron's rod of priestly power. That is the three signs of God's covenant with Israel. The bread, the commandments, and priestly power. In Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 and 16, we read, you shall, this is God uh, explaining to Moses uh, how to make, first of all, the tabernacle, and then how to make the most precious item in the tabernacle, the holy, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant. We read in 20, Exodus 25, you shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long. By the way, cubits are roughly 18 inches. Depending on which uh, rule of measurement you use, it's about 18 inches. So two and a half cubits, you can figure out your math is better than mine, how many inches that would be. And one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. 
In the ark, you are to put the covenant, which I will give you. So these three items were the very symbols and the substance of the covenant that God made with Moses and through Moses with the people of Israel on Mount Sinai, in the book of Exodus. In Hebrews chapter 9, fast forward into the New Testament, we have a description of what you could find inside the Ark of the Covenant. The author of the letter to the Hebrews writes, Behind the second curtain, now this is describing the, the tabernacle. Um, behind the second curtain stood a tent called the Holy of Holies, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, just like described in Exodus 25, which contained a golden urn containing, holding the manna, rare Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Let me just say a word about Aaron's rod. Have you ever noticed when the bishop is celebrating Mass? Have you ever noticed some of the paraphernalia, some of the accoutrement that uh, he carries and wears? He has the miter, the hat, and then he has the staff, the rod of priestly power. Well, that is a, a modern-day version of what was kept in the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod of priestly power. If you want to read about, uh, what is that? What is Aaron's rod of priestly power? Uh, go back to Numbers chapter 17. Let's see if I can find it here quickly. I've got a bookmark in it. Convenient. Uh, in Numbers 17... Verse 16, there's a, a rebellion afoot. Numbers is basically the, the time of period between uh, the giving of the law and the covenant being sealed at Sinai, the 40 years of wandering in the desert. And then you have the book of Deuteronomy, Moses' last uh, words uh, in, in, in the area of Moab, the plains of Moab. He gets to see the Holy Land, but he doesn't get to enter the Holy Land. So that's the book of Deuteronomy. So between Mount Sinai and Moses' last words to the people before they cross into the Holy Land under Joshua, you have the story being told in the book of Numbers. At a certain point, the, the people rebel. A, one of the Reubenites named Korah. I think that was, I think he was one of the Reubenites. Korah, I'm sorry, he was one of the Levites uh, and some other uh, descendants of Reuben uh, start a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. And they want to say, we want to be able to rule as priests, not just Aaron as the high priest. That would be like me and Father Martin and maybe some of the priests in the Fort Smith deanery saying, hey, we want to take over the diocese and we're going to oust Bishop Taylor. So that's what's happening in Numbers chapter 17. Uh, and so you can imagine what the outcome of that would be. Let's read. In Numbers 17, verse 16, The Lord now said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and get from them a staff for each ancestral house. Twelve staffs in all. Twelve tribes of Israel each give a staff. From all the elders of their ancestral houses. Okay, I'm going to decide who's the high priest. God says to Moses, I'm going to decide. Write each man's name on his staff. And write Aaron's name on Levi's staff. So Levi, one of the tribes, 12 tribes of Israel. But Aaron is going to have his name on Levi's staff. So this, he's not just going to be another priest. He's going to be the high priest. For each head of an ancestral house shall have a staff. Then deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the covenant. Tent of meeting, the tabernacle. In front of the covenant, in front of the Holy of Holies, where I meet you. That's where Moses would enter to speak face to face with God. The staff of the man whom I choose shall sprout. Thus I will rid myself of the Israelites grumbling against you. If you skip down to verse 23, the next day when Moses entered the tent of the covenant, Aaron's staff, representing the house of Levi, had sprouted. But it goes on. 
Here's the funny part in the Bible. Now, the Bible is great. It had put forth sprouts, produced blossoms, and borne ripe almonds <laughs> with an exclamation point. So that's where, uh, that's why there is Aaron's rod, his staff, his, his symbol of priestly authority. And not just any old priestly authority, but high priestly authority. And that's contained in the Ark of the Covenant. Next, Mary is the new Ark. Containing in her womb, Jesus. Jesus is everything that the Old Testament symbolized, signified, and sought after. And he's the fulfillment of it all. He who is the bread of life. Not just the manna, but he is the bread of eternal life. He is the grace that helps us keep the laws of God. So you had the laws of the Ten Commandments, but you didn't have the grace and the, the, the ability to be able to keep it. And so Jesus is now the grace to be able to keep the law, symbolized in the two tablets of stone. And he is the high priest who gives us his life-giving sacraments, where we get the grace through the high priesthood, through the bishop and the priest that minister with him. So we read in John chapter 1, verse 17, For the law was given through Moses, the old ark. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ, the new ark. What, what is contained in the new ark, you could say, contained in the womb of Mary. And then I have another quotation from Hail Holy Queen. The Greek word for brother, Adelphos, literally means from the same womb. From John and Irenaeus through Ephraim and Augustine, the early Christians believed that the womb belonged to Mary. That is, not only did Mary, as the new Ark of the Covenant, bring forth Jesus from her womb, she brings forth all of us. And in that sense, she is our mother, spiritually speaking. When we speak of Mary as our blessed mother, we are evoking that sense that she is the Ark of the Covenant. As she carried Jesus in her womb for nine months, so Mary carries us in her womb. And we are all Adelphoi, Adelphoi, brothers and sisters in Christ, born from the same womb of Mother Mary. Let me just conclude with Mary as the icon of the church. And this is a quotation, if you have your, your study guide notes, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I'm just going to read this, and I'm going to finish with a quick image. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches in number 972, After speaking of the Church, her origin, mission, and destiny, meaning all of us Christians, where are we headed? Where did we come from? Where are we going? We can find no better way to conclude than by looking to Mary. Of course, of course, in her we contemplate, we prayerfully ponder what the church already is in her mystery on her own pilgrimage of faith. She is where we want to be. We are pilgrims on our way home. And what she, meaning the church, will be in the homeland at the end of her journey. There, in the glory of the most holy and undivided trinity, in the communion of the saints, the church is awaited by the one she venerates as mother of her Lord and as her own mother. I hope you can see the convergence of all these images. The queen mother, the, the new Eve, the Ark of the Covenant, all converging. And not just clashing, but lifting our hearts and minds to the glory of God's grace at work in the church trying to fashion us to be a little bit more like Mary, the masterpiece of Jesus. It goes on in number letter B. In the meantime, the mother of Jesus, in the glory which she possesses in body and soul in heaven, is the image, the beginning of the church, as it is to be perfected in the world to come. Well, they just said it more beautifully than I was stumbling to say a minute ago. Likewise, she shines forth on earth until the day of the Lord shall come, the end of time a sign of certain hope and comfort to the pilgrim people of God. And I mentioned there, Luke chapter 1, verse 28, how that is the meaning of full of grace. The Greek word, the 
Luke used was kekari tomene. Whenever you have that repetition of the first, uh, uh, the first uh, syllable, karis, you have kekaris. Uh, that means absolutely full, jam-packed, the most. Uh, it's a superlative, you could say. And we hope to be individually as Christians and collectively as the church like her. Let me just end with this uh, image that I have of uh, what, what I do and try to help uh, couples who are getting married. As you know, many couples have a rehearsal the evening before the, the wedding itself. And as we're getting organized as a wedding party, you have the, the bridesmaids on one side, you have the groomsmen on the other side. I'm trying to corral them like, you know, like, it's like herding cats sometimes. <laughs> and uh, But I always tell them, something they all want to know. Where do we look? The, the, the men are standing there looking around. The women are looking around, the bridesmaids and the groomsmen, and they want to know where to look. Where should we be turning our attention? And I always tell them, all eyes on the bride. All eyes on the bride. So as she's at the door, turn and stand about a 45 degree angle, eyes on the bride, wait till she comes in. As she gets to the altar, and moves to the altar, all eyes on the bride. Turn and face her. Why all eyes on the bride? Well, so that it all looks nice and nicely choreographed and like we know what we're doing. But there's more to it than that. There's a theological reason for all eyes on the bride. And that is because every bride represents the church at the end of time. What is going to happen at the end of time? A wedding that would put the, the wedding of, uh, of anything happening to the royal family in England to shame, with all due respect. This is the wedding of Christ the King. And who is his bride? The church. And all those who, in, in whatever mysterious, magnificent way, according to God's will, will be part of that church. And at the end of time, there will be all eyes on the bride. And we hope to be part of that bride. And that's why I tell them. It's not so that the bride gets a big head. Oh, hey, look, they're all looking at me. Wow. Uh, no. It's because she's a symbol of the church. And the church, in its fullness, is Mary. And let me leave you with this last quotation before I start crying here. I get kind of moved when I'm talking about my mother. Uh, from Scott Hahn's book, and you have it behind me there because I really wanted you to, to see it and maybe even ponder it uh, after this class is over. From page 49, it's kind of it's, it's a little, a little uh, edgy, if you don't mind my saying. Make sure you can see that. Revelation, you know the last book of the Bible is called the book of Revelation, but it's also called the Apocalypse. Well, he explains a little bit more deeply what that means. Revelation is the usual English rendering of the Greek apocalypsis, apocalypse. But the Greek word is richer than that. It is more accurately translated as unveiling and was used by Greek-speaking Jews. And remember, the Greek-speaking Jews were the ones outside of Palestine in the diaspora that, who translated the, the Bible from Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek. So we have the Septuagint, the 46 books of the Old, Old Testament. The Greek-speaking Jews to describe the moment when the bride was unveiled before her husband, just before the couple consummated their marriage. What is the book of Revelation describing? A marriage. What is the end of the world going to be? A marriage. And what is the, the final moment of the end of the world? A consummation. When there is this unveiling, this revelation, and the bride, the church, in all her splendor, is unveiled in her perfection without spot or wrinkle or any such thing as St. Paul describes her. Uh, and what will be unveiled will not just be the veil taken off her face, but taken off everything else. <laughs> that's apocalypsis. The moment before the consummation. And that's the end of the world. The consummation of the wedding of the Lamb. And so why is one of the last words of the book of the Revelation, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus.
Come, Lord Jesus. And so too should we. As we look to Mary, she who is already there, waiting for us to be perfected so that we can be part of the bride and enjoy the end of the world, <laughs> the apocalypse, which is the unveiling and the consummation of everything. What I'd like to do as we conclude is uh, end with a prayer called the Litany of Loretto. Many people pray this at the end of the rosary. I'd like to pray it with you now. It's at the, it's at the next page of your study guide, the Litany of Loretto. Here's the background to it. This Litany to the Blessed Virgin Mary was composed during the Middle Ages the place of honor it now holds in the life of the church is due to its faithful use at the shrine of the Holy House at Loretto. It was def definitive, definitely approved by Sixtus V in 1587, and all other Marian litanies were suppressed, at least for public use. Its titles and invocations set before us Mary's exalted privileges, like I've been trying to define for the past hour, her holiness of life, her amiability and power, her motherly spirit and queenly majesty, all of which we just talked about bursting forth in the pages of Scripture. And now let's pray it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll say the, uh, the, the leader part and the response, but you pray it in your hearts with great love and devotion to Mary. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Holy Mother of God, pray for us. Holy Virgin of Virgins, pray for us. Mother of Christ, pray for us. Mother of the Church, pray for us. Mother of Divine Grace, pray for us. Mother Most Pure, pray for us. Mother Most Chaste, pray for us. Mother Inviolate, pray for us. Mother Undefiled, pray for us. Mother Most Amiable, pray for us. Mother Most Admirable, pray for us. Mother of Good Counsel, pray for us. Mother of our Creator, pray for us. Mother of our Savior, pray for us. Mother of Mercy, pray for us. Virgin Most Prudent, pray for us. Virgin Most Venerable, pray for us. Virgin Most Renowned, pray for us. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us. Virgin Most Merciful, pray for us. Virgin Most Faithful, pray for us. Mirror of Justice, pray for us. Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Cause of our Joy, pray for us. Spiritual Vessel, pray for us. Vessel of Honor, pray for us. Singular Vessel of Devotion, pray for us. Mystical Rose, pray for us. Tower of David, pray for us. Tower of Ivory, pray for us. House of Gold, pray for us. Ark of the Covenant, pray for us. Gate of Heaven, pray for us. Morning Star, pray for us. Health of the Sick, pray for us. Refuge of sinners, pray for us. Comforter of the afflicted, pray for us. Help of Christians, pray for us. Queen of angels, pray for us. Queen of patriarchs, pray for us. Queen of prophets, pray for us. Queen of apostles, pray for us. Queen of martyrs, pray for us. Queen of confessors, pray for us. Queen of virgins, pray for us. Queen of all saints, pray for us. Queen conceived without original sin, pray for us. Queen assumed into heaven, pray for us. Queen of the holy rosary, pray for us. Queen of families, pray for us. Queen of peace, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Grant, we beseech thee, O Lord God, that we, thy servants, may enjoy perpetual health of mind and body, and by the glorious intercession of the Blessed Mary, ever virgin, be delivered from present sorrow, and enjoy everlasting happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Jerome, pray for us. St. Luke, pray for us. The Immaculate Conception, pray for us. One last thing. Here's a little uh, preview of coming attractions, as I like to say. Session 5 will be the Law and the Prophets. Please read Luke. We're going to skip ahead to chapter 3, verses 1 through 38. The footnotes, the Old Testament in the New Testament. Obviously, the Law and the Prophets is about the Old Testament. And if you get a chance... Uh, for all you overachievers, A History of the Bible by my friend, John Barton. Uh, please try to get through pages 72 through 111. I know that's a lot, but he's a good writer, and he's a lot of fun. So, enjoy. Enjoy.